Hi everyone, and welcome back to our experimental design lecture videos. In this lecture video, I'm going to go over some common experimental designs that do not meet the requirement of a true experiment. Although experimental designs are ideal for proving causation, sometimes we simply can't make all of the elements exist within our design. And this is where quasi-experimental designs come in. A quasi-experiment is a design that does not meet all three requirements of the true experimental design that we discussed in the previous lecture. Now, quasi-experimental designs are not as strong for proving causation because of these limitations, but they're often necessary due to resource limitations, ethical concerns, or other research constraints. There are multiple types of quasi-experimental designs, but in this course, you'll only be required to remember four specific designs, the non-equivalent control group design, the static group comparison design, the one group pretest post test design, and the one shot case study. First up, the non equivalent control group. This is the experimental map for the design. It looks pretty familiar, right? What makes this not a true experiment? Did you catch it? The non equivalent control group design does not use random assignment, so it's missing a capitalized R on the left of the experimental design map. The lack of random assignment means that the experimental and control groups likely start out as different than one another, which makes all comparisons between the two groups more suspect. Non-equivalent control group designs are useful when you have concerns about diffusion or demoralization and you want to geographically separate the two groups. For instance, let's say you wanted to study the impact of a drug use awareness program on a group of high schoolers. If you try and do the experiment by randomly assigning the students within the same school to the experimental and control group, there is likely to be so much overlap, overlap and interaction that it will make diffusion and demoralization a significant concern. To reduce this, you may decide to use high school A as your experimental group and high school B as your control group. That way, all of the students within a single group school are part of the same group, which reduces the potential overlap. This means, though, that you cannot randomly assign students from your sample into both groups because you can't change someone's school temporarily for the purpose of the study. So if high school A and high school B are different in terms of their student body, it will influence your results. But you can do your best to match A and B to be as similar as possible in terms of demographics, student characteristics, size, etc., so that you can minimize those differences. Here's the static group comparison model. Now we've taken away random assignment and we've removed the pretest. So we're left with only the treatment and two post tests. Like the two group post test only design in the true experiments lecture, this type of design does not allow for before and after comparisons because we never measure the variable before the treatments applied. But unlike the true experiment version, now we also have non randomly assigned groups that may or may not be similar to one another again, making the post-test comparison between the two more difficult. Static group comparisons are often are commonly used with pre-existing treatments, things like gender and race. These type of treatments can't be introduced into the sample because they already exist before the experiment starts. So there's no way for the researcher to measure the before state of the pretest. Unlike the two group post-test only, the use of a treatment like gender or race also restricts us from using random assignment because I can't randomly assign someone to the male or female group. Static group comparison is a pretty common quasi-experimental design. Another common one is the one group pretest post test, which is mapped exactly how it sounds. Here we gather data only from an experimental group, so everyone in the sample will receive the treatment. This type of design allows us to do the before and after comparison that's missing from the static group design, but it doesn't allow us to, for, to control for outside variables that may cause spuriousness in our data. So that's a big concern. The last type of quasi-experimental design that I want you to be familiar with is the one-shot case study. This is the easiest experimental design, but the absolute worst in terms of proving causation. Here, you use a cross-sectional design in which data is only collected one time from one group. So there's no way to compare before and after, and there's no way to compare people who did and did not receive the independent variable. Like I mentioned though, this is one of the most common designs because it is so simple. There are also things called natural experiments. All of the previous experiments are considered lab experiments because there's some artificiality, <clears throat> excuse me, in the experimental design itself. The researcher is purposefully manipulating events, moving people, and making decisions to complete the experimental design. 
However, natural experiments involve no research or manipulation. Instead, these are treatments that happen outside of the researcher's control that are then studied using the before and after approach. In social science, natural experiments may focus on a law or policy change or a natural disaster to see what the impact of, was, of that event was on the entire population. They may also focus on life events like the date of a person's marriage or the death of a loved one. These type of events cannot be ethically controlled by the researcher, right? I'd like to see an IRB willing to force subjects to marry one another for research purposes. So we use a natural experiment to study them before and after. All right, well, that concludes our discussion of quasi experiments. Thanks for watching, everyone.